put your hands together. Give the Lord a shout. You are not of them that say you are small. Come on. You want to say with talent that you possess the land. Give the Lord a shout. Giant. Come on. The bigger they are, the harder they fall. in the house you can be sitting and possess your promised land if 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 you are what like me this morning you want to rise and possess your promised land you want to bring your giant down somebody give the lord a shout give the lord a shout when you pray when you pray when you pray when you pray they're gonna come 
you praise, when you praise, when you praise, they're gonna come. When you worship, says the worship. When you worship, they're gonna come. When you worship, says the worship. When you worship, they're gonna come. When you shout, they shout. When you shout, they're gonna come. When you shout, just shout. When you shout, they're gonna come. When you shout, somebody shout. When you shout, they're gonna come. When you shout, just shout. When you shout, they're gonna come. They're gonna come down. Talk to your situation now. Come on. That situation in your life. They're gonna come down. 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 Let's see that swagger now. Come on. Come on. They're gonna come down. 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 Let God arise, let God arise, science, God, he the Lord of soul. Somebody free, somebody free. Your words are Jericho are falling, Jericho words are falling, Jericho words are falling, Jericho words are falling, the giants are dying. The giants are falling. The giants are dying. Be the Lord of show. Hallelujah. This morning we have an awesome testimony. It is coming from my brother John. Amen. Indeed, the scripture says that all things work together for you. Everything is working together for your good. Amen. Brother John says that Every morning before he steps out of his room, he asks the father to wrap him in his hand and to cover him with the blood of Jesus. He said in the compound where he lives, there is some space for parking cars in the house, but then they have to move the cars out in the morning to make room in the compound for other things to happen there. He said he has a particular spot where he parks his car, but Yesterday, he drove out a new car. According to him, he said, tear rubber. Say tear rubber. Fresh. Registered just two weeks ago by his company. And that was what he was driving. And I'm sure he felt cool driving that car. When he moved out of the house and got to where he normally parked, he realized that another car had taken that spot. And according to him, he said, it is a car he doesn't know, which meant the car probably wasn't in their compound. And so he decided to use the next spot available. He drove there and he parked. He said somewhere around 1 p.m., he heard a loud, a loud bang outside. And he rushed out of his room because he knew a car had crashed. So he rushed out of his room to the scene. He said when he got there, the exact spot where he has been parking, which had been taken over by another car, a taxi had rammed into that car. A taxi had crashed into that car damaged the rear of that car. The taxi itself was badly damaged, running into several thousands of cities by him. I think that they have the, picture, the pictures. If the TV room can show the pictures for us, yes, that's it. It had so badly damaged. He said for like 10 minutes, he stood speechless. He didn't know what to say. And then suddenly he burst out thanking God. This is a good place to clap. And the amazing part is that he said, often when he parked, he stayed in the car to make some calls. But he knew that instant that God had delivered him from just crashing a newly purchased car by his company, even though it was no fault of his. And God has also saved him because he would have stayed in the car to make some calls. Beloved, we serve a living God. God will give another person in ransom for you. 
he will save you. You may be in a particular predicament or situation right now, and you may think God has abandoned you. It is working for your good. As you praise God, you will see that your giants will come tumbling down. Amen. Let's welcome Mamie with a, a clap offering. Praise the Lord. Powerful testimony. Let's put our hands together and worship God for the great deliverance, for protecting what belongs to us. God will always protect what belongs to you. Amen. Can you smile at somebody, welcome somebody into the house of the Lord? Welcome somebody into the house of the Lord. You never know who you are greeting this morning. That person might be your next wife or next husband, your next boss. Yes, yes, if you like that, put your hands together. Somebody who will network you tomorrow, you never knew. Amen. God is so good. Powerful ministration. Let's put our hands together for the choir. Good delivery. Good delivery. God bless you. This morning, you are welcome once again into the house of the Lord. Your life will never be the same. Your life will never, never be the same. We had a good time in the first service, and I believe the second service is going to be awesome. Tell somebody, awesome. This is my Bible. It is the Word of God. It has the power to change my life and to give me an inheritance amongst the saints. I'm not a hearer only, but I'm a doer of the Word. Wave your Bibles at me and shout hallelujah. Amen. Will you please take your seat in the presence of the Lord? Amen. It is July our month where we are turning laymen into lay ministers, church members to church workers. It's our month of ministry and your life will never be the same. Give the Lord an amen, somebody. A story is told <clears throat> several years ago of this pastor that was transferred to Leeds in England. A few weeks after he had been transferred <clears throat> to the city, <clears throat> He had an appointment on the other side of town, and so he boarded a bus. And while he's getting on, he paid the bus driver. The bus driver gave him, a, gave him some change and gave him in excess. When he sat down, a thought came to him. You have to give back this money to the driver because he gave you in excess. And then another thought came to him. Well, the bus, they, they are a big company. They, they, they don't need the money, so why don't you keep it? When he got to where he was alighting, he walked to the driver and gave him back the change and said, you give me in excess of 50 pence. And the driver said to him, are you not the pastor who has just come to town? He said, yes. He said, well, I've been contemplating where to be going to church, and so I wanted to see whether you are real. The, the pastor got down the car. There was this pole by. He just held on the pole. He was feeling dizzy. He said, wow, I would have sold the Lord Jesus for just 50 pence. Basically speaking, that man made his integrity show. People see what people see you or what people see in your life. It's how they see Christ. If you are here with me, give the Lord an amen. And so you've always got to be on your guard and remember that you are carrying the name of Christ on your forehead and your shoulders. And once you say you are a Christian, people will judge you with that. If you are ready for the word of God, lift up one hand as a sign of surrender. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, it's time to declare your word. The word is already anointed. I ask that you anoint these lips of clay. Grant me utterance. Make me a blessing to your people in Jesus' name. And will the saints say amen. Today I want to look at the character of the minister. For us, we know that every born again child of God is called to be a minister. Minister is one called to serve. A minister is a leader. Jesus said in Luke 22 verse 26, it says, but it shall not be so to you, but he that is greatest amongst you 
Let him be as the younger, and he that is chief as he that is serving. So Jesus was saying that if you are a leader, if you are a minister, you must serve. A few weeks ago, the U.S. Vice President Mike Pence said to the National Students Leadership Conference at the American University in Washington, and I quote, he said, people follow people they respect. So first of all, if you aspire to leadership, you, pass, you must aspire to be men and women of character, unquote. Let me give it to you again. He said, people follow people they respect. So first of all, if you aspire to leadership, you must aspire to be men and women of character, unquote. Character is the foundation upon which life is built. And so what is character? Character is defined as the mental and moral conduct considered as good or bad. Character, they are the attributes that define an individual. Like Jesus said in Matthew chapter 7 verse 20, wherefore by their fruits you shall know them. So you are not known as a child of God by the money you have, by the intellectual capacity you have, but you are known as a child of God by your fruits. And so character transcends all religions, nationality or cultures, languages, groups, ages, social status, gender. Character is a universal thing or a universal standard which is inscribed in the conscience and heart of every person because character deals with the daily struggles of our human nature. That word character is a derivative word from a Greek word that means chisel. Chisel is a tool that shapes things. And so when we talk about character, we are connoting that we are chiseling out or removing something out. Let me quickly share with you three things about character. Number one, character is the raw material of your life. Character is the raw material of your life, and so you must chisel it out well, develop it. Number two, character is not inherited. It's a product of the habits that you have trained your life with. You can't say that your father had a good character, so you would have one. No, you have to train yourself to have a good character. Number three, character is developed and built. Character is developed and built. It is a chiseling process that helps you develop your personality. A lot of the times we confuse charisma and character. There are times we see people who have charisma and we say, this guy has character. No, there's a difference. So let's quickly look at some of the differences between character and charisma. Charisma can gather. If you are in ministry, Charisma can gather people, but it is character that will keep them. If you're a businessman or woman, charisma can get you business people, the adverts, etc., uh, uh, customers and clients, but it is your character and attitude that will keep them. Number two, charisma generates favor and sparks off excitement. Charisma is very inspirational. However, character gives substance. Character gives substance and is founded on substance. Number three, if you only have charisma, people cannot tell you when you are wrong. When you are wrong, they can't even tell you. Because people with charisma without character tend to abhor criticism, even from their close associates. Charisma makes you always burden to perform, even when you are dried up. And anytime you are not doing what the people know you for, you are afraid you will lose their loyalty. But character gives you loyalty. Charisma puts you under pressure, makes you want to please the people, the pressure of the people. And so you are compelled by your own aura to please the people no matter what. But character makes you do the right thing. Number four, 
Charisma inspires fanatical loyalty. But when the real test comes, it is character that will keep those people. Character maintains a strong support base. Loyalty fizzles out when there is only charisma. Followership desert the charismatic leader, but character stabilizes them. So quickly, let's follow the Apostle Paul as he tries to look at what character is or the character of a minister. In 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 1, he, from verse 1, he says, This is a true saying. If a man desires the office of a bishop, you can substitute that word bishop there with minister or pastor or doing ministry. So this is a true saying. If a man desires the office of a minister, he desires a good work. A minister then must be blameless, the husband of one wife, vigilant, sober, of good behavior, given to hospitality, apt to teach, not given to wine, no striker, not greedy or filthy looker, but patient, not a brawler, nor covetous. One that rules well his own house, having his children in subjection with all gravity. For if a man know not how to rule his own house, how shall he take care of the church of God? Not a novice, lest being lifted up with pride, he fall into the condemnation of the devil. Moreover, he must have a good report of them which are without, lest he fall into reproach and the snare of the devil. Let's quickly look at these qualities here the Apostle Paul gives of the character of the minister. And then we'll look at some of them in detail. Number, the first one he talks about is that he must be blameless. That is, he must have integrity and be honest. He talks about husband of one wife. That means he should not be polygamous. He should not, and if he's, if he's a woman, he should not be going after people's husbands. He should be vigilant. That means he should be circumspect, temperate, and self-controlled. If He should be sober. And sober, according to the Merriam-Webster's dictionary, is having or showing a very serious attitude or quality. So he should be sober. And sober also means marked by moderation. So he should be marked by moderation. If he's a minister, he should be sub subdued in tone or color. So even in the way you dress, in the way you do things, you shouldn't, it shouldn't be loud if you are a minister. That's what the Merriam-Webster's dictionary says. And the one I like among the definitions of sober is showing no excessive or extreme qualities of fancy. That means that if you are a minister and you are sober, you cannot go extreme in your fancifulness. The way you make your hair, the way you, do, you, you wear your clothes, the way you fix your face, and all that. It should not be excessive or extreme. Amen. It, it also say, Paul also says, must be of good behavior. Be of good behavior. The Amplified Version says, must be sensible and well behaved. So if you are a minister, you must be sensible and well behaved and dignified. That means you lead an orderly and disciplined life. It's, it says, not, not a drunkard, not given to wine. So you shouldn't be drunk. You, should, you, you, you shouldn't be drunk if you are a minister. You shouldn't be quaffing, quaffing all the whiskey and beer and all those things. Amen? You shouldn't be, you shouldn't be on alcohol. No striker. No striker. The Amplified says not combative, but gentle and considerate. No striker. When we got saved... It was normal for a believer not to drink. In these days, when you say that a believer should not drink alcohol, some will be asking you, where in the Bible it, 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 did it say we shouldn't drink alcohol? Get my book. <laughs> Breaking the power of drugs, alcohol and tobacco. Amen? And I prove in there that the Christian is not supposed to be drinking alcohol. Amen? No striker. Not combative. But gent fighting with people in your office. Amen. Can't you, Bana? 
What is can tissue bana? When when we were we go to the beach, we fight. Then when some when person is on the floor, he says, Can tissue bana? And he's on the floor. If you are a minister, no striker, you are not fighting actually. Amen. No brawler. No, that means not quarrelsome, but forbearing and peaceful. Amen. The minister must be peaceful, must not be a brawler, not greedy or filthy looker. That means does not love money. Today, we see all kinds of ways by which people get money. And it's amazing that some of them, the things they do, some are Christians. I mean, you go to the market, you want to buy orange, and some, the orange is green. And so when they peel it, it's green. They will dip it in dye so that it will look yellow. Some will inject the watermelon with dye so that the inside will be red. All kinds of things that people are doing today. No wonder sicknesses, incurable diseases, because the foods we eat, we don't know whether it's genuine or it's something. Hello? And it's because people want to make money. Today, people have all kinds of ways of making money. If they work in the office, they will add zero to the number. They, oh, in the past, women never used to be thieves. These days, women are stealing banks and things. <laughs> in the past, if you, if, in the past, if you had a fellowship, anything at all, or any group, any society, they say, oh, the treasure should be a woman. This time when you make a woman the treasure, some of them are chopping the thing left, center, right. Amen. But if you are a minister, <laughs> you should not love filthy, uh, 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 filthy looker or don't love money. Leading his household well. If you are a minister, you must love your spouse. You must raise your children well. Your children must be raised in the fear and the knowledge of the Lord. So that is the list, rundown of the list the Apostle Paul gave us. I want to just major on three of them today. Number one, the honest or uh, blameless. He said the minister must be blameless. That he must be full of honesty and integrity. Honesty is to be truthful. It means to be trustworthy. It means to be open. Not prone to cheating or stealing. To be honest is to be sincere. And not given to deceitful tendencies. When we say somebody is full of integrity... That means the person is full of moral uprightness. That person is decent and honorable. Amen? They are somebody who means what they say and say what they mean. So if you are a minister, you must mean what you say and say what you mean. If you are full of integrity, it means that when you tell somebody, I have a, this is the appointment, I'm going to be there, you will be there. If you can't be there, you inform the person to know why you can't be there. Amen? When the early church was going to choose deacons, in Acts chapter 6, from verse 2, the twelve called the multitude of the disciples unto them and said, It is not reason that we should leave the word of God and serve tables. Wherefore, brethren, look ye among you, Seven men of honest report. So they, in choosing people to serve, they were, they, they were having complaints in the distribution of food and distribution of clothes. And to get people to distribute the food and distribute clothes to serve tables, they said, let's get people of honest report. To have an honest report means you have a good reputation or a good name. Do you have a good name in your office? Do you have a good name in the church? Do you have a good name in the community where you live? In Proverbs 22 verse 1. He says, a good name is rather to be chosen than great riches and loving favor rather than silver and gold. So Paul, uh, uh, um, sorry, Solomon was saying here that to have a good reputation is better than money. There are people with money without a good reputation. There are people with money and everybody knows even though they have money, they are cocaine dealers. There are people with money and everybody knows that even though they have money, they don't sleep at night. They sleep in the, they sleep in the, uh, 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 in the daytime and work at night. That means they are armed robbers. Amen? So, 
They can be rich, but do they have a good name? There are some who are rich, yet everybody knows that they, were, they are prostitutes. But Paul is, uh, Solomon is saying a good name is rather to be chosen than great riches. So having a good reputation is very crucial to your life. J.C. Penney, the owner of J.C. Penney stores all over the United States of America was reported to be drinking ginger ale when somebody mistook that soft drink he was taking for whiskey and then went to town with the story. J.C. Penney, that J.C. Penney was a whiskey drinker. When J.C. Penney got wind of that story, I quote what he said. He said, a reputation I value has been smeared by ginger ale. Henceforth, it will be plain water or tomato juice for me, unquote. J.C. Penney said, I, have, I cherish my reputation. They are smearing my reputation with the drinking of ginger ale. If ginger ale will be a problem, then I'll just drink water and I'll drink tomato juice. Amen? This is somebody who valued his reputation. That is how serious your integrity must be to your reputation. Amen? You've got to protect that reputation. Don't gloss over those pertinent things which impinge on your integrity. Value them. Amen? In Romans chapter 12 verse 17, it says, Recompense to no man evil for evil. Provide things honest in the sight of all men. So the Bible is not saying provide things honest in the sight of God. It says provide things honest in the sight of men. That means that your Christianity should not just be a matter between you and God. It should be a matter between you and your neighbor. Amen? Between you and God, only God can see your heart. But your neighbors must see that you are a minister, you are a true Christian. I've told you the story before of this boss who asked his staff one day, he went to the office one morning, I think that morning he was very excited. So he asked the staff, how many of you know I'm a Christian? And all of them were quiet. After that time, ah, he was getting embar embarrassingly too quiet. So he said, ah, don't you know I'm a Christian? One person raised their hand and said, boss, your Christianity is secret. Ask somebody, is your Christianity secret? <laughs> if your Christianity is secret, it means nobody knows you are a Christian by virtue of your acts. Because for you, you are probably the only epistle some people may read all their life. If you can hear me, give the Lord an amen, somebody. Or if you want to clap, do it well. So the scripture says, provide things honest in the sight of all men. Your life in this world is not predicated on a matter between you and God. The issue about your character shouldn't be left between you and God. Your neighbor should have a positive perception about your worth. Very important. Amen. Number two, responsibility. Responsibility. The minister must be responsible. He must be accountable. Amen. Responsibility is accountability. It means you are morally accountable for your actions. You must be morally accountable for your actions. During the Second World War, Winston Churchill, the Prime Minister of Great Britain said, and I quote, he said, the price of greatness is responsibility, unquote. So the price of your greatness is responsibility. You must be accountable. Beloved, responsibility is the highest form of maturity. The minister who eliminates responsibility or he backpasses or excuses things. It's like our great-grandfather Adam and our great-grandmother Eve. When they sinned in the garden, Adam said to God, the woman you gave me. Our, our great-grandmother also said, the serpent made me do it. Now, knowing how good God is, the Bible doesn't say that, but I think, because God is a forgiving God. That's what the Bible says. If Adam had said that, I have sinned. God, forgive me. I'm sure the story would have been different. Amen. God would have forgiven mankind. Give the Lord praise. Give him thanks. Give him praise. Give him thanks. But Adam excused it. Don't ever excuse your fault. One of the things where I love David, Saul sinned when Saul sinned. And the prophet Samuel said, you have sinned. He said, the people made me do it. 
David sinned by sleeping with Bathsheba, somebody's wife. And the prophet Nathan came and said, you have sinned. He said, God, forgive me. Against you and you only have I committed this sin. I have sinned against you. Amen. Saul was blaming other people. Don't pass the buck. Don't, 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 don't put blame on other people. The minister takes responsibility. He takes responsibility for the failures. When there is success, he spreads the success on the team. Amen. But there is, when, when there is failure, he takes responsibility for the failure. The Bible tells us in Matthew chapter 25 verse 24 about the, 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 the parable of the talent. The one who received one talent. The Bible says, Then he which had received the one talent came and said, Lord, I knew you that you are a hard man, reaping where you don't sow and gathering where you have not strawed. I was afraid and went and hid your talent in the earth. Lo, there you have what is your own. That guy was blaming his boss. He was blaming his boss for his ineffectiveness. Don't ever blame other people. Don't blame God if there is, you know, Church of Pentecost, they have something they say that they are young people say, if you don't go to heaven, don't blame Jesus. Amen. So you've got to take responsibility. If you don't win souls, it's your responsibility. You've got to take responsibility of your life. You've got to take responsibility to be an effective minister. If you fail, take responsibility for it. Don't act like that fearful servant and try to blame those in charge of you. Why are you not making it that you are blaming other people? And there are so many who are blaming, they are, they are blaming their circumstances. They are blaming their father didn't take, their parents didn't take them to school. They are blaming everybody but themselves. It's your responsibility to either make it or not make it. Take responsibility for your life and your future. And stop wallowing in your troubles. Tell somebody stop wallowing in your troubles. I was, I was checking the meaning of the word wallow and it said, to, to settle in a pool of mud. And you know it speaks. Who like to wallow in the mud? And there are times we wallow in our troubles. We want to ravel in our troubles. But even as a slave. When Joseph was a slave. Instead of I mean just enjoying the troubles. And complaining about the troubles. He said to his brothers. In Genesis 45, verses 4 and 5, he said unto his brethren, Come near to me, I pray you. And they came near. He said, I am Joseph, your brother, whom you sold into Egypt. Now be not grieved nor angry with yourselves that you sold me hither, for God did send me before you to preserve life. Joseph was saying, Look, you guys, you meant it for evil, but God meant it for good. Now, if you are a minister, you come to, you, you are that person who knows that no matter the circumstance, God will turn it for your good. Give him praise and give him thanks. Hallelujah. Before Joseph's brother, before, when Joseph's father died, his brethren came to him. They said, our father said that you should not hurt us. I'm sure they were lying because they had been lying from the beginning. Then when they sold him, they said he, he was dead. They brought some cloth with goat's blood and gave to the father. They've been lying from the beginning. You know the you know, there was a time there was this tribe. The prince wanted to marry their sister. The, that guy had raped their sister and said, I'll marry their They said, oh, let everybody circumcise. And the, all the people circumcised. And they went in. When the people, they had circumcised all the men in the city and killed everybody. They could lie. So I'm sure they were lying. But then Joseph said to them, he said, you meant it for evil. But God meant it for good. I came to tell somebody that whatever even the devil uses against you, God will use it for your good. Whatever plan and purpose the devil has against your life, God will turn it for your good. Whatever it's a disadvantage, God will make it an advantage for you. If you can hear me, give the Lord an amen. That means that you've got to see the silver lining in your troubles and take advantage of it. Amen. Tell somebody, see the silver lining in your troubles. In Romans chapter 8 verse 28, it says, And we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are called according to his purpose. If you are a minister, you have been called by God. And because you have been called by God, the Bible says all things will work together for your good. 
I came to remind somebody that everything you are going through, God will use it for your good. There is nothing that you are going through that will be for your bad because he has a plan for you, not of evil, but of unexpected end. God will glorify his name in your life. Give him praise and give him thanks, somebody. Give him praise, give him thanks, give him praise, give him thanks. David, when, when he returned to his town, Ziklag, and saw that they had taken all their families, the Bible says he and the people, they wept until there was no more spirit in them. And the people were ready to stone him. But the Bible says, and David encouraged himself in the Lord. There are times you must be your own self-motivator. You must motivate yourself. You must encourage yourself in the Lord. There are times outside forces will want to discourage you. Instead of being discouraged and being frustrated and thinking that is the end of you, you would encourage yourself in the Lord. From today, may you be able to encourage yourself in the Lord. May you never be destroyed on the inside. You see, when you encourage yourself in the Lord, everything outside may be down, but you'll be standing up on the inside. It reminds me of that small boy who was in class and he decided to stand and the teacher said, sit down. And then he stood up. The teacher said, sit down. And then he stood up again. The teacher said, sit down. And then when he sat down, the teacher looked into his face and realized that, no, no, no. The guy, even though he was sitting down, there was something wrong. He said, hey, boy, you are, you are sitting down. But you are. The, the boy said, yes, even though I'm sitting down on the inside, I'm standing up. And so you may be sitting down on the inside, on the outside, but inside you are standing. Oh, and nothing will stop you. Shout hallelujah, somebody. You know, it reminds me of that guy who went to church. And this guy didn't have shoes. And so he would sit in church. But anytime the preacher was preaching, he would be shouting hallelujah. He would be shouting hallelujah. And then one day there was this man, he the boy was disturbing him with his hallelujah. So after service, he called him. He said, look, I'm going to give you a shoe. And when I give you the shoe, next time, when the preacher is preaching, don't say hallelujah. The boy took the shoe, so he wore the shoe to church. And then the preacher was preaching and the message was good. The preacher was preaching, the message was good. At a point, he started saying, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It got to a time he threw the shoe aside and jumped up and said, shoe or no shoe? Hallelujah. Tell the devil, devil, whatever you are bringing against my life, hallelujah on the inside. Shout yes. When you take responsibility, you stop blaming the devil for your inactions. Stop, bl stop blaming the devil. He has no part in this one. Are you understanding what I'm talking about? I say he has no part in your life. Greater is he that is in you than the devil that is in the world. And there are more with you than those that are against you. The devil only succeeded in getting one third of the angels. Two thirds are in heaven. They are on your side. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. They are also on your side. The devil has no part in your life. And so victory will be your portion. Take responsibility for your life. Go out there and succeed. Stop blaming. Tell somebody stop blaming the devil. Amen. You, you know the story. How the devil was sitting somewhere crying. And this man asked him, Mr. Devil, what is the problem? He said, is it not the Christians? Everything they blame me. What I haven't even done, they blame me. We are not going to blame him. Ah, because we are taking responsibility for our lives. Give the Lord an amen. amen. You've got to take responsibility for your ministry. In 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 10, Peter said, Wherefore, the rather brethren, give diligence to make your calling and election sure. You have got to give diligence to make your calling and election sure. Amen. He says, if you do these things, you will never fall. Uh -huh. So it is your responsibility to succeed in ministry. And I came to, to encourage somebody that you will succeed. Uh, you, you did it. I said you will succeed. You will do ministry and succeed. You will do ministry and go forward. Where other people have failed, you will succeed. Where people are saying it cannot be possible, you will make it possible. Because you will give diligence. When we say diligence, it means that you are working hard and working smart. 
Amen? So you work hard and work smart to make sure you excel. And that will be your testimony. I can see some of you becoming pastors. Some of you becoming evangelists, elders, deacons. I can see some of you becoming bishops. I, oh, in the next few years, I can see so many bishops. I can see so many prophets, so many evangelists, apostles, pastors, teachers. You are one of them. Lift your hand and shout hallelujah, somebody. Amen. You've got to be responsible for your health. In 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 8, Paul tells Timothy, For bodily exercise profits little, but, godly, but godliness is profitable unto all things, having promise of the life that now is, and, and that which is to come. Some read this and they say, Oh, Paul says that bodily exercise are only little profit. Yes, Paul was talking to Timothy. Timothy was a bishop amongst the Greeks. And the Greeks loved to do athletics. And so Tim Timothy was getting too used to the athletics and the church was getting too used to athletics. So Paul was telling them, don't forsake godly things at the expense of physical exercise. Amen. And so he was telling them that yes, bodily exercise has some little profit, but concentrate on the spiritual things too. Amen. Amen. But in our days, we have concentrated on godly things and left physical exercise. You must take responsibility of your, for your health. Today, the doctors tell us they have moved from the place of curative medicine where you get sick and they take care of you to the place of preventive medicine. In preventive medicine, they say a lot of the sicknesses and diseases we have in our days are lifestyle sicknesses. That means that if you change your lifestyle or if you, or if you live well, there are some of the sicknesses you won't get. It has to do with your eating. Yes, if you want to clap, please do it well. It has to do with your eating. It has to do with your exercising. There are some of us, our heart is flabby because we get up from bed we don't, ex we don't do anything. We go into our, we go and bath, we go into our car. There's air conditioning in our bedroom, air conditioning in our living room, air conditioning in our car. Air con our kitchen has air conditioning. Air conditioning in the office, air conditioning in the church. Because very soon it's going to be here. Hallelujah. And, 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 and we get... We, 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 from, our, from the house to the car, car to the office, we don't walk. The, when, when we get to the office, take the lift. And so for some of us, our heart, when we climb uh, 10 flights of stairs, then we'll be panting. <sighs> when you climb stairs and you are panting, it shows you that your heart needs exercise. And the least you can do is every day walk at least 30 minutes. Walking 30 minutes will help your heart. Amen. And when you are eating, some of us, when we want to eat, fat, trophy, pig, 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 what's up? Nane, nane. How do you call nane? Pig feet. Amen. Pig feet. And, and, and when the soup, ah, 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 Fat on it. We want to eat your kagari. Uh, uh, and we don't like the under of the zomi. Say, how do you know? I, used to, I eat a lot of your kagari. Hallelujah. When we are eating keke and fish, we have fish, we have trophy, we have sardine, we have mackerel. We mix it and then we have, we have lobsters and we have shrimps and we have squid and they are all fried hallelujah I say how do you know uh, when we were we <laughs> amen in the morning when we want to have breakfast we have sausage we have bacon we have baked beans fried eggs we fry four eggs we put it in the bread and we buy and we buy Ben's bread white flour, sugar in it, and then we do milo or, or hot chocolate and we pour, we take 40 spoon, tablespoons of sugar and add 
If it is porridge we are eating, the sugar we add. Very soon you see, you go and they say your sugar level is high. because. And then for some of us, it's the food we eat, the fish we don't touch. You see the banku and the kenke, the fish is small like that. But, and the worst part is those who eat at night. Those who eat at night. Say, I'm tired. I came back from work, I'm tired. And I, I went to sing, I went to preach. You know, a lot of us preachers, very soon we are in trouble. Because you preach in the evening, you come back, you are hungry. But the Bible says, if you, are, if you love food, put a, a knife to your throat. Amen? That means that you need to check. You need to hold yourself in check. So you come and it's 10 p.m. And 10 p.m. you now have heaped the food. You have your kinke and your fish and your fufu and banku and things. And then you are, in the name of Jesus, I bind the calories in the... Those calories cannot be bound. Amen? Calories cannot be bound in the name of Jesus. Amen. The only way you bind calories is to check how much you eat and to eat well. You eat vegetables. Most Ghanaians don't even want to eat vegetables. You eat vegetables, you are eating fruits and things. Amen. And some of us, we are all, in a day, we drink so many soft drinks, so many bottles of soft drinks. You are killing yourself. Take responsibility of your health. Number three, and then our land. Perseverance. Amen. Perseverance is the steadfast pursuit of an objective. So you want to pursue ministry. Pursue it steadfastly. And steadfastness also means stamina, consistency, resolve, firmness, and endurance. So you want to be consistent. Last week we filled a form for department. Departments. You don't know what to go one, two, three, three times and then you stop. No. Keep going. The Bible says be steadfast, unmovable. Keep going to the departmental meeting. Tell somebody, keep going to the departmental meeting. Some of you in your department, you only go when we are going to have a program. When we say Dr. Morisello is coming, you will go and join the choir. When we say Dr. Morisello is coming, you will be, you will be part of the protocol. After Dr. Serulu goes, you will drop from the department. Tell somebody it should not be so. Amen. You will be consistent. You will endure. Paul said to Timothy, in 2 Timothy chapter 2 verse 3, he says, Thou therefore endure hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. You have got to endure hardness. The mark of a good Christian soldier is endurance, stamina. Amen. It is said that a good soldier should be able to beat the rain to eat his cake. That means rain or shine, you are there. Amen? If, 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 if you, are, you have consistency, whether it's raining or it's shining, you are coming to church. Amen? In other words, you should be able to endure the pain to achieve your end. You should be able to endure. Amen? Tell somebody be able to endure. The fact that you had some challenges in your life or in your department or in your ministry doesn't mean that you should quit. Perseverance means you are not giving up. Tell somebody I'm not giving up. Where others have not succeeded, you will succeed because you are not giving up. When we did geography, they told us that rivers don't take the path of least resistance. Amen. Now, there are some people, they just want, when they, when they get a place and, you know, they, they see a little rock, then they just go away. The river, when it meets a rock, it will still look for a way to go bypass the rock and still flow. You must flow. The fact that there is a barrier, the fact that there is, there is a handle in front of you doesn't mean that you must stop. The fact that you tried to do ministry and you failed one time doesn't mean that you must stop. God has called you as a child of God to be a minister. If you can hear me, give the Lord an amen, somebody. Tell somebody I am a minister. And so Proverbs chapter 24 verse 16 says, Proverbs 24 16, it says, For a just man falls seven times. He didn't say for a just man may fall. He says for a just man falls seven times. 
But I like the continuation. It says, and rises up again. So if you are fallen, rise up again. Don't stay where you fell. That means that if you fail, don't stop at where you fail. Try again. I prefer somebody doing something and failing than the man or the woman who is not doing anything, who knows everything we must do, but is doing nothing about it. I prefer the one who is doing something, the one who is a meter and a greeter and is not doing it well, and we have to teach the person how to do it. The one who is singing in the choir, and instead of singing, ah, he's singing, Kee! I prefer that one, that I prefer the person playing the organ or the guitar and instead of playing key A, he's playing key Q. Oh, oh, I, I, I prefer that person. Hallelujah. I prefer somebody doing something with their life. I prefer somebody who is effective with their life. I prefer somebody who is going somewhere. That person may make mistakes, but thank God. Whoever succeeded without making mistakes, the only person who doesn't make mistakes is the one who does nothing. Amen. The man who invented the light bulb was asked. And until he did it, we were, we were using lanterns in the world. Lanterns. And then he tried. The first time he failed, 9,999 times. And then somebody was, was bold to ask him. How did you feel when you failed 9,999 times? He said, no, I didn't fail 9,999 times. I learned how not to do it 9,999 times. And the 10,000th time I succeeded. I came to tell somebody, you may fail, but don't stop there. Keep on keeping on and succeed. Give the Lord an amen. Listen, when you fail and keep failing and keep failing, and you succeed one time, people don't remember your failure. They remember your success. And that will be your story. You will succeed. You will do effective ministry. You will be a sign and a wonder. You will be a surprise to the people that know you. You too, you will be the source for some. Give the Lord an amen. Because the Bible says, if you desire, if you desire, if you desire, it will be so in your life. In Micah chapter 7 verse 8, says rejoice not against me O my enemy when I fall I shall rise when I sit in darkness the Lord shall be a light unto me and so beloved tell, tell somebody tell somebody tell somebody sitting by you listen to me my enemy in this world who is the devil should not rejoice because today I'm not at my fullest he should wait because whatever it is I am rising up. I am rising up. I'm coming out of obscurity. I will be a sign and a wonder. Ah, that is why people cannot celebrate. When they, 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 oh, hey, hey. I said they cannot celebrate when they think that that is your end because it's not your end. As a child of God, it is not your end. God has not written you off yet. God is just about starting with you. If you can hear me, give the Lord an amen, somebody. Tell somebody, God is not right with me. He said, when I sit in darkness, the Lord will be my light. That means in the time when I'm in obscurity, just wait, my light is coming. Ah, it says for pain and darkness will be in the night, but joy cometh in the morning. Your joy is coming in the morning. I said, your joy is coming in the morning. Your victory is coming. Your breakthrough is coming. Your favor is coming. Your open door is coming. Your oh, God is lifting you up. Where others have failed, you are going to succeed. You see, anytime they tell you nobody has ever done it, eh, this thing you want to do, nobody has ever done it, then it is an opportunity for you to also do it. Anybody who has ever done something before he did it, they said nobody had ever done it and he did it. You are going to be that person in your family, in your profession, amongst your peers. You are going to be that person. They said that place, you can't have a church. They said that place, you can't have a cell. That is the more reason why you will want to have a cell there because you will want to write your name on the sons of time. Give the Lord praise. Give the Lord praise. Give the Lord praise. Give him praise. Give him praise. Give him praise. 
when the history of, your, of the world is written, you want your name to be there on the sands of time. Listen, when the history of Perez Chapel International is written, you want your name to be written somewhere that this is that man or that woman who opened 20 churches. This is that man. Amen? When you go to the Pentecost uh, 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 Convention Center, you will see some women whose names are on halls because there was a particular woman, she sold all her property when Apostle James McKeon came to town and was starting. She took all her jewelry. She sold all her jewelry and gave it for the start of the church. There's a big hall that is named after her. Her, child, her child became the general secretary. Her, great, great, her grandchild became the general secretary. Her grand, that will be your story. I said that will be your story. Amen. That will be your story. I came to say to somebody, there is the character for a minister. That character is something that nobody can take from you. But that character is built from the inside. And I can see you building that character, that character of integrity, of blamelessness, that character of taking responsibility of your life and you not giving up and going forward to succeed. Bow down your head. Let us pray. You are here and you want your sins forgiven. I want to pray with you whilst our heads are bowed and our eyes are closed. You want God to forgive you your sins. Lift up one hand. I'm going to pray with you. You want your sins forgiven. Yes, thank you, my friend. Thank you, my brother. Thank you, my sister. You want your sins forgiven. Lift up your hand. I'm going to pray with you. Yes, you want your sins forgiven. Lift up your hand whilst our heads are bowed. Our eyes are closed. Lift up your hand. You want your sins forgiven. Thank you, thank you, thank you. You want your sins forgiven? Yes. If your hand is lifted, will you please stand? If your hand is lifted, please stand. Yes. You want your sins forgiven? Yes, please stand. You have this bad habit. You want to break. Yes, will you also stand? I'm going to pray with you. You want your sins forgiven? Thank you, my brother. Thank you, my sister. Yes, you want your sins forgiven? Please stand. Yes, you have this you have this habit you want to see broken in your life. Stand. I'm going to pray with you. You will never be the same. If you are standing, can you take your Bible, your bag, your purse, walk out of your seat, walk to me in front here. I'm going to pray with you. Yes, walk out of your seat. Don't feel shy. Come and join me in front here. I'm going to pray with you. You will never be the same. You want your sins forgiven. Yes. Yes, you want your sins forgiven. Take your Bible, your bag, your purse. Yes. Take your Bible, your bag, your purse, and walk and join me in front here. You want your sins forgiven. Today is your day. Today is your day. You want your sins forgiven? Yes. You want to be free from every, every bad habit. In the name of Jesus, today is your day. Yes, today is your day. Will you please lift up one hand? And will you pray this prayer with me, church? Will you lift up one hand? If you are watching by television, listening by radio, also pray this prayer with me. Say, dear God, forgive me all my sins. Lord Jesus, you died for me. You rose for me. Come into my life. Make my life a testimony. To those who know me, thank you, Lord, for answered prayer. In Jesus' name, amen. Will you put your hand on your chest? Let me pray for you. Heavenly Father, I commit these dear ones to you. I pray that they will know you and know you better. I pray that every, power, every yoke of sin will be broken of their lives. and You set them free and they will serve you all the days of their life. In Jesus' name, amen. Church, will you please stand with me? And church, if you, are, if you are here today worshiping with us for the first time, come and join us in front here. I want to welcome you. If today is your first day worshiping with us, take your Bible, your bag, your purse, come and join me in front here. Join us in front here. Today is your first day worshiping with us. Come with your Bible, your bag, your purse. Come to me in front here. Today is your first day worshiping with us. Today is your first day worshiping with us. Today is your first day worshiping with us. Take your Bible, your bag, your purse. Come and join me in front here. Today is your, today is your first day worshiping with us. Oh, put your hands together for them. <clears throat> put your hands together for them. Put your hands together for them. Today is your first day worshiping with us. Today is your first day worshiping with us. Today is your first day worshiping with us. Oh, you're welcome, you're welcome, you're welcome. Today is your first day worshiping with us. 
Today is your first day worshiping with us. Yes, you are welcome. You are welcome. You are welcome. You see this dear lady on my right, which is your left. Will you please follow her? We have some trained pastors who will talk with you briefly. So follow this dear lady. Church, put your hands together for them. 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 You can do it better than that, church. Put your hands together for them. Put your hands together for them. Glory to Jesus. Oh, hallelujah. Glory to Jesus. Glory to Jesus.